Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yes. Welcome. You can't hear me at the back? No? Can we do something with the sound? Can you hear me at the back, sound people? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for coming today on this lovely warm day um, to celebrate the return of the Granada Art Archive TV to Manchester, um, having spent a while in a warehouse uh, in a mystery location in Yorkshire for 20 years. Um, I don't think I need to tell you that Granada TV has a very significant place in British uh, television history and still holds a powerful place, I think, in the cultural memory of Northerners in particular, and perhaps quite a few of the people here. Once described as the greatest television company in the world, it's found, it was founded by Sidney Bernstein in 1954 and began broadcasting to the North in 1956 when independent television was born. Granada produced many path-breaking programs, some of which I hope we'll talk about today, but we'll also be discussing the current landscape for regional TV as, as well as the history of Granada TV. So we're pretty open today about the format that this In Conversation takes. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, whether you're in the room or watching via the live stream. And, um, and if your evaluation, I've been asked to say, your feedback is important to us. Please do take a minute to give us your feedback before you leave. Uh, there are two questions to answer and you will also get asked for feedback on Eventbrite. Most importantly, with the launch of the British Pop Archive, of which this is part, we'll be hosting a series of events, of which this is just the first one in the autumn. If you'd like to find out about that programme, which we'll share soon, do sign up on the Creative Manchester mailing list or connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you. Right, now I've done all that, I'd like to introduce you to our guest today, who I'm very pleased to see here, and thank you for coming. Um, I'll start off with Dorothy Byrne, who is currently president of Murray Edward Cor College in Cambridge, and she began her television career as, at Granada as a producer in World of Ac on World of Action. She, I'm world in action, sorry, I've lost the ability to speak. We did have a very long lunch, but I haven't actually drunk anything. <laughs> I think all the sugar's gone to my head. Um, she became head of news and current affairs at Channel 4 in 2003, before moving to a role as editor-at-large for the company until recently. She's won the, uh, she's made a fellow of the Royal Television Society for her outstanding contribution to television, and won the RTS Journalism Award for Outstanding Contribution to Journalism. She's the author of Trust Me, I'm Not a Politician, A Simple Guide to Saving Democracy, and I think some of the themes in that book we'll be talking about today. She's also an alumna of the University of Manchester. David Alushiga, OBE, is a historian, writer, broadcaster, presenter, and filmmaker from Newcastle-upon-Tyne, now based in Bristol. I'm also very proud to say he's one of my colleagues in history at the University of Manchester. His recent work includes the multi-series A House Through Time, RNHS, A Hidden History, and the BAFTA award-winning Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners. He's professor of public history at the University of Manchester and recently appeared as an expert witness in the trial of the Colson Four. Finally, but not least, <laughs> Lisa Williams, another alumna of the University of Manchester, this time of the History Department, is the BAFTA award-winning television filmmaker responsible for the critically acclaimed BBC series, The Yorkshire Ripper Files, a very British crime story. She has an extremely impressive track record as a producer and director of programmes, including Catching a Predator on BBC Two, Stacey Dooley Investigates and Panorama. Born near Manchester and studied in Manchester, she now lives and works in the city. So thank you very much. Very pleased to have them here today. I wanted to start off by talking about Granada TV and I wondered if you could talk to me a bit about 
your memories of Granada, either working there or, or the television programs that they produced and what, what they mean to you. Because I know that I was very excited about the Granada archive coming back to Manchester, but maybe you could share some of my excitement with the audience. So if I ask you first, Dorothy. Well, I actually started on Granada Report nice. and it was amazing, um, not least because of the presenters like Tony Wilson, but also because we could just go in and say, I want to investigate what's happening to uh, homeless people in Withington, or, you know, you could just come up with an idea for doing a, a, a really important regional subject and to investigate it. And even although you were new, you were allowed to go off and make a 20 minute film yourself about it. And that was really important. It wasn't just news, it was proper investigation as well. And then of course, you know, World in Action, you know, probably the best television current affairs program ever made. And, uh, you know, so exciting to work on. It had its downsides, you know, at the time I first went to work there, um, I was the only woman at that time and um, everybody was white and there were some terrible attitudes. But um, even although some of the men had attitudes like dinosaurs, they made these absolutely magnificent, daring programs and they weren't incredibly expensive. You know, um, people talk about, oh, you need loads and loads of money to make a program now, so you need to be Netflix and have a million pounds of program. You don't, you just need to be passionate and angry and to know, to, to be rooted in your area. And we need to be clear, World in Action was the best current affairs program in the world because it was rooted here uh, in, in Salford Stroke, Manchester, and even people who came from the south of England who were allowed in, um, you know, they, they, they just saw things in a different way to the way people saw everything in London. David, I, I told you you could talk about Granada or you could talk about another regional station since you didn't grow up in Manchester. Well, I, I got into television in the, the late 90s, and at that point, it was the very tail end of ITV's franchise system, which yeah. was going to end in 2004. And I think growing up, I presumed that you could be anywhere and work in television, yeah. because I looked at Time Tees in Granada and Yorkshire, and it seemed rather um, national. I didn't understand how London-centric it was and how London-centric it was going to get. I remember Granada programs very well. I remember World in Action. And what I've sort of learned in the years since, particularly being a journalist, is the number of times when I've looked at a story and there'll be a World in Action about it. Um, growing up in Newcastle, the biggest scandal in the modern history of that city is the Poulsen affair, the T. Dan Smith affair, that, that horrific corruption in planning and uh, the building of um, social housing. And it was a world in action that blew that apart and that is still shapes how that city's relationship with local government is. So I, I in some ways, Granada and you know, being by far the most successful of the Northern franchises, it gave me a sort of false sense of what television would be like. I didn't think when I want, decided I want to go on television, I didn't realize how London-centric it was and how I was inevitably going to have to spend much of my career um, in, in London. And by 2004, that, that was absolutely the case. I, I think the fact that Manchester is on the rise again as a city of, of television and film production, I think is, it should never have fallen. There was an obvious momentum when Granada, uh, when ITV consolidated. It was around that time the BBC decided to move things north. But we're still not at the place where there is a regional uh, uh, presence outside of London that has the confidence and the swagger and the self-belief and the, the, the dominance that Granada had. Yeah. Lisa, you make programmes here, <coughs> so you may want to respond to that. I but... do. I think, what, what, I think what my memories of Granada um, is through childhood and teenage years, is it had a very distinct iconography. You knew something was made by Granada. It was very clear, it was very obvious. I don't think that, I don't think there's an equivalent now, really. I think it had a very, very strong identity. Um, 
and I think what, that, what you say really rings true with me, actually, because I, I graduated university in 2004 and I wanted to make documentaries and I did work experience at the BBC on Oxford Road. And I slowly realised that there really wasn't very much work. And I, like you, I didn't really understand how it all works. And I didn't really understand the history. And I think there was a, a, a lull at that point. And I went to work in newspapers because I couldn't afford to live in London. You know, I, I didn't really know how I was going to get into TV. And I ended up eventually having to move to London um, to work in documentaries. So, yeah, I completely think that that was the case. It was, it, it was the nothing has, has um, equaled it since. And I think that things are definitely a lot better now in, in Manchester for, you know, work-wise, you know, I, I live in Manchester again, I work in Manchester, but I, it, it's definitely improved a lot, but um, it, it's still not at that point, I don't think, in terms of, you know, regional pro, programme making. So we, we hear a lot about levelling up, um, about moving things out of, of, of London, which usually just means Manchester, um, because that's the only northern town that many politicians have heard of. Could we have another Granada TV? Can you see a kind of renaissance happening? David? Um, a lot of jobs have moved out of London. A lot of commitments are made. Um, I, I've worked in Media City when I was a producer at the BBC. I came up, I think it was for not quite a year. Um, and I would, I mean, I think the, the most important site um, to understand how that works is uh, Manchester Pic Piccadilly Station, the train to London on a Friday um, evening. Um, that sort of temporary uh, partial residence of Manchester, that sort of not real commitment um, to Manchester or any regional city, I think is absolutely hardwired into the culture of television. I mean, I, I still hear regularly from commissioners at all broadcasters um, the idea, sometimes openly, sometimes uh, more subtly put forward, that there are London producers who are real producers, who can make real programmes and are, should be taken seriously. And then there are people in the regions. There are all sorts of stories, I won't make it, name any names, of programmes that were either taken over or there was an attempt to take them over, to parachute in people from, from London. Um, that I, the, the metropolitan bias in television is not just about where the money is spent or the decisions are made, though that's absolutely fundamental. It's a cultural. It's about confidence. It's about the fact that London owns the confidence that used to be partially resident in Manchester because of, because of Granada. And of course, Granada, its confidence built out into the BBC in Manchester. Again, at the beginning of my career, Manchester was one of the places that you could come. The, the, the BBC on Manchester Road was seen almost as an equivalence to, to being in London. The, Again, this should never have happened. This, this level of dominance of London was allowed to happen because the decline, the consolidation that led to the loss of Granada was foreseeable. It was a long um, uh, evolutionary process. And the industry, if it had been serious, and if the people in charge had not all been in London and not concerned about these issues, about uh, metropolitan bias, that should have been preempted. We lost something of enormous importance, regional confidence. And talking about levelling up now, well, why did we allow the levelling down to happen? It's deeply, deeply cultural. I, I've, it, it is to, to not commit to London as a producer is to open yourself up to being patronised, to being dismissed, being belittled. Why aren't you in London is a question which really means why aren't you good enough to be in London, which is an awful supposition. Mm. Yeah, that's, that, that's is that your experience too, um, Lisa? Yes, it is. But I think what happens is you get to a certain point in your career or you've made something that somebody likes and then they latch on to that and then sometimes they think, oh, you're an exception to that, so we'll let you make something, we'll let you do something. Um, but then if something goes wrong within that production, they'll then blame somebody else that is within that, that team. It, it, it can, I mean, it really just depends. Some people are really open to, to me making films in Manchester and are absolutely fine with the whole thing being made in Manchester. And it really is down to the individual and whether you're dealing with a decent person or you're dealing with someone that's got um, prejudices. Um, and I think, I can see things changing slightly, um, but the problem is often I end up making programmes for London production companies, even though I'm making the whole thing in Manchester and I'm based here and the edit will be here, the money still goes back to that London production company. So that's, I'm not really helping the situation by doing that, but then I need to work and I can't always work for local-based companies. So it's, um, 
Yeah, the, uh, you know, individual filmmakers can't really make a big enough change. You know, it needs to be some kind of seismic decision to, you know, to move, to, you know, to make a decision. We will make all of that there, you know, and it, that, that, that comes from the top, doesn't it? You can't really do that as an as a individual filmmaker. I think that, that inbuilt bias is mm. so powerful that people, senior people in television will uh, go onto, onto a public platform and announce with uh, solemn, uh, either, um, uh, with great sort of, you know, solemnity that 50% of programming will come from outside of London. Well, London's 13.4% yeah. of the population. So what we're saying is we're only going to give London four times or three times its share of this critically important and financially beneficial industry. This idea that we are going to bequeath you the other half and keep ourselves four times the rate of the rest of the country. The fact that that is a sort of seen as a great uh, uh, position that can be trumpeted rather than something to be worried about and, and legislated against, I think shows the the, the problem with the metropolitan bias is not just that it's, it's real, and it's, it, but it's, it's, it's unquestioned by the people who are trapped within it. Dorothy, what would the big strategy well, be? The obvious yeah. thing is that instead of privatising Channel 4, you should move it lock, stock and barrel to Leeds. Sorry, Manchester. <laughs> I did actually favour Channel 4's HQ being in Manchester, not Leeds. Again, not to be offensive to Leeds. But for me, it was a no-brainer that if you want to build an alternative power base to Leeds, make it all in the one place uh, to, to London. But I, I do think that um, Channel 4 should be moved in its entirety to Leeds. I don't think you can do that and privatise it as well. And I would include in that the news. And there will be struggles. There will be struggles to get... London politicians on, and I'm sure they'll be much missed by the viewer, <laughs> but, um, you know, you'll get other people on. And then the second thing I would say is if you look at the departments that are of the BBC that are based in Manchester, are they really the key departments? Now, religion, I get that God is pretty central in many people's lives and top person and all that. But it, what about current affairs, news and documentaries of the BBC? Why are they not based up here? So I think you need a big shift, um, both of the BBC and, and a complete shift of Channel 4. And that would, um, that would make a really big difference. So all this messing about that we hear that we are told that we're going to get rid of the license fee for the good of broadcasting in Britain, and we're going to privatise Channel 4 for the good of broadcasting in Britain. If you really wanted to help Britain, and if you really wanted to level up, those are the two absolutely obvious things you would do. And it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I mean, I, I, we're talking about regional television and the fate of it, but is there a rather bigger existential threat, not just to Channel 4 at the moment, but the BBC as well? I mean, how can we see any of these shifts happening? What has to happen, Dorothy, in order well, I for... Think, um, people are being told that Channel 4 being privatised is over here, and the attack on the BBC licence fee is over here. You have to, the first thing you have to do is say that they're all part of the same thing. I don't necessarily believe, as some potentially conspiracy theorists do, that this is the Conservative government setting out to destroy any um, potential opposition to their views. I think that they are throwing a bit of red meat to effectively very few of their supporters, but obviously for them key supporters, and that they honestly do not realise that if you strip away the way that the BBC and Channel 4 are currently organised, you are so undermining the massively trusted television system that we've got that you will effectively be undermining British democracy. And this shouldn't be seen as just something for some liberal lefty people to talk about. This is something 
they're undermining the institutions of our country, and in particular, democracy. The solutions to that, David? How are you going to fix it? Um, <laughs> I, I think it's, 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 it's always television that's the target. It's always this industry, which is one of Britain's great success stories. I mean, this is, we are told that the Conservative Party is the party of business, well, this is a great business success. I think it's so cultural. I think the fact that it is red meat, that it is an attractive proposition to members of you know, certain constituencies, um, certain you know, electoral coalitions, I think is the problem. Because we, we, this is a, 75% of the press is owned by, by billionaires. This campaign against public service broadcasting is 40, 50 years old. It's become part of people's worldview without them ever thinking about why it was why it was introduced. One of the most sort of depressing things to me is that whenever I've been around filming around the world, whenever I've usually working with the BBC, whenever I've talked about the BBC, the respect with which it is, and British television, but the BBC in particular, is held around the world is just astonishing and humbling. And it would be embarrassing to admit to those people who were so you know, uh, uh, admiring of the BBC uh, how it's regarded in Britain, how we are a country that's incubated this campaign against it. It's, it's one of our greatest achievements. Television appeared in many countries in unregulated and chaotic forms in a very patrician and rather paternalistic way. The BBC was created, then there was a second revolution in the 1950s with ITV and the franchise system that almost accidentally made it national. Then Channel 4, another kind of accidental you know, a, you know, moment of genius evolution rather than the ITV2, which is what people presumed it would be, this incredible channel with its own identity and, 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 uh, and mindset. We've been so lucky. We've almost stumbled into having this ecosystem where our programs are admired and sold and copied around the world. And yet the constant experience of anyone who works in television is to be under the attack of successive governments. Um, this is an act of national vandalism. And in some ways, I think the, the, one of the first steps is to recognize that this is not a natural state of being. This is a political campaign led by billionaires who would much rather have an unregulated system so that they could increase their profits and their margins. So can we learn something from that kind of older model of, of regional television companies? I mean, what was, what was different then? I mean, these were commercial concerns, not public service broadcasting in that sense. So why did that work better than, than what you're describing today? Dorothy, why, why, is, why was Granada TV, a commercial concern, a, a better model? Well, of course, we have to be clear, I had something of a monopoly of the advertising, and we can't just dream about the past but what they did, as David says, you know, they didn't quite know the wonderful thing that they were going to make when they um, created the broadcasting system that we had. Um, they created regional powerhouses. And I think the key thing that I've thought about um, coming here today, because I was another person who, to get on in my career, had to go to London when I realised I didn't want to work any... Well, I thought things were going a bit wrong at Granada and I'd better go and um, uh, go to London where there were more opportunities for work. But coming here today, um, it, it, it had such passion, such confidence, it was so rooted in the area that it was in, the people who worked for it came from the area. I mean, that's a, a really important thing about why the programs were so good, why it was so vibrant. You know, I remember at the time of Hillsborough, you, um, when World in Action made a special program on the Monday, Nobody who worked on that program had to have anything explained to them about what had happened. So many people had been affected by it indirectly or directly. Everybody just understood the significance of it. If I had been in London, 
people would have been going, oh, you t tell me about why that football team means so much to that city, etc. So, um, so it, it was a... It was a powerhouse just in the same way as look at the buildings that we're surrounded by, the great power of the Industrial Revolution in Manchester. It was this amazing power of the television revolution in Manchester and, and really extraordinarily important as a period of time. Just something what you're saying about the importance of place with regional TV, that it's not just that it comes from programme makers from a particular place, but that it becomes, starts to represent that place. And I wonder how we can recreate that. I know we came on with Anne-Marie playing the Coronation Street music, but there's something very important about Coronation Street, wasn't there, as a programme that talks about ordinary people's, ordinary working class people's lives. That must have been quite revolutionary at the time for people to see on the TV. Is there a danger in, in re, as regional <coughs> programme makers, if you don't mind me calling you that, do you feel that you have to represent the whole of Britain or the whole of England, or do you make things sometimes that have a sense of regional identity? Can you, can you do that? I, I get a sense that it's much easier to do that if you work in TV in the devolved nations than it is in England. I think you can, but you can't just do that anymore, I don't think, because there just simply isn't enough work yeah. to span that. You know, I make programmes, you know, abroad, you know, about, about the North West, you know, I can travel anywhere, really. But I think when you do make a programme that's, that's from where you are from, it, it really does resonate far better and it, you know, it is really important, but I think it's also very, very difficult to, you know, to, to only do that. Because of the model that we yeah, have the, the model the model doesn't the model doesn't doesn't support that really. You know, people are making programs. They're based, you know, they can be, they can be based anywhere. You can be based in London and make a program about Yorkshire. You know, there isn't really any sort of logic to it. Well, because because so many just makes programs about you, yeah. which isn't it? I think the thing is there's yes. so many individual there's so many production companies that are coming up with ideas for programs that are you know they can be from anywhere at all so that connection isn't necessarily always there and I don't think it always has to be there either but um, it, it's very difficult I think to to have that model now really but the way potentially a way of achieving it, apart from moving Channel 4 to, to Leeds or Manchester. Um, the same dilemma that Granada had when they were choosing between those two cities um, 70 years ago is it's about independent production companies. Yeah. And the vast, overwhelming uh, uh, preponderance of production companies are in London. And there's absolutely no reason for that, for that to be the case. Television can be made anywhere. Yeah. The stuff you do on location or the stuff you do in the studio is a very small part of it. Where you do the writing or the research and where you do the editing doesn't matter. It's not actually a physically, uh, it's not dependent on place. It is possible, despite the views of many people in television, to edit a program and not be in Soho. Um, and that almost seemed like it was breaking some law of the universe when it was you know, in the minds of some people. It is by its nature a fleet of foot, flexible, geographically um, um, uh, um, variable industry. What it needs is it needs clusters of independent production companies who are guaranteed percentages uh, of the work because you don't get uh, commissions unless you're outside of London. Now that's beginning to happen, but again, that will guarantee you, we, 13.4% of the population, will guarantee you the rest, 50%. It's patronizing. That, those clusters that we need, they are the only way of even approximating the confidence of Granada, because Granada was about the region. I was reading a, a book about um, Granada, and it was the, the, one of the criticisms of it was it was Manchester-centric. I've never heard the word Manchester-centric. <laughs> I long for that word to return and to be a complaint and for us to be able to you know, uh, take the bosses of Manchester production companies and criticise them for their Manchester centricity. The fact that it's, in, it's not part of our algo is because everything is about the capital. Um, th this industry is special because it's, it tells us who we are, it tells our stories. And if it's telling the stories of 13.4% of the population, or if that 13.4% of the population are telling our stories from outside of it, it can't be what it should be, which is a shared medium telling shared stories. And in my experience, you know, a couple of decades in television, it's really failing to reflect those stories. I don't feel 
that people like me from the council estate in the towns I grew up in and went to university with get a fair share of the cultural capital that comes with television. And when I look back at those programs um, made when I was a kid um, in, the, in the Northwest, I think that was much closer to where we need to be and we have gone backwards. The fact that television is so London-centric is a key reason for the failure of our politics. So if you look at what happened with Brexit and the fact that basically television news and journalism got it wrong, they, um, a lot of that was because too many of them were in London. But I can think of a really specific major problem in this country that is poorly covered and therefore politicians deal, deal with it poorly and that's rail travel. You know, I've worked in TV for 40 years and again and again when you see, sto and I, I, you know, I've seen it on so many network television programs when they're talking about commuters they just go outside the door and they film London and round London. Would we actually have the catastrophe that is HS2 if we had still got really powerful news and current affairs outfits in Leeds and Manchester? It's extraordinary how difficult it still is to get from Leeds to Manchester. Uh, and that, that and that that has been allowed, and our politicians are debating how they're going to get from London to Birmingham all the time. Uh, uh, so th that would be a, a, an, an absolutely concrete example of how London-based news and current affairs coverage has given us entirely the wrong policies for our country. So. To return to a question I asked before, are, are, are people better served by their television in the devolved nations than, than say, in the north of England or the southwest of England? Is, is that a model that we can copy, or are there problems with that too? I don't know well, how much. People in Scotland would, um, I think they probably are, but they again look at the, the, take the BBC, they look at how much license fee money is raised in Scotland and how much is spent there, and again they see that discrepancy, and that discrepancy is because so much is in London, because it's disproportionately in London. I think the, the other problem, if I can just slightly change the subject, is I spent most of my careers um, in the BBC, a lot of it in BBC Bristol. Uh, you don't hear regional accents in many production companies, even in the cities when they're based outside of London. Um, there is, it, it's not just London, it's the, it's the, it's the South East. The South East is 22 million people, it's about 40% of the economy. The South East's dominance, so someone said the biggest town in Britain is this donut shaped city called just outside London. Yeah. Um, and just outside London and London are, the, dominate almost everything. And the form of television devolution we have is to encourage people from London and just outside London to buy flats in places like Manchester and Leeds and live there a couple of days a week. Um, if you're running a rail franchise, it sounds great. If you're trying to create regional television that has an identity that's connected to a world beyond the southeast, it doesn't work. That site of, I remember, this is slightly bitchy, but I remember being on a train when I was working in BBC in Media City, um, being opposite this woman who was who I knew worked at the BBC, who was heading home to the home counties and who was uh, on the phone with her husband talking about the cost of their daughter's, their daughter's um, horse riding pony lessons um, as we sort of steamed through Stockport. And it was, it was just, they were living in an absolute other world. And that, that sort of, it, it's like absentee landlords in sort of Ireland of the 1870s. It's, they're not connected, there's no willingness. I think one of the most shocking things about Channel 4's move is that so many people offered a very nice deal to leave small houses in London. I mean, what, it was tiny, they the number. They were scared of the North. Yeah. They'd never <laughs> been there, and they got all their ideas of it from TV. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the other effect of Coronation Street, you see the bad effect. <laughs> The thing but, is, I've got the, I, I have a bit of an opposite experience because I, I worked in London and I decided to move back obviously and, and I was slightly concerned because I thought I need to be working and several people said to me, if you move back to Manchester you're never going to make anything good again, you're never going to make mm. good TV again, which I knew was not true and it, and it absolutely hasn't been true at all. 
but I now know quite a lot of people that are based in London that are maybe not from London or they can't afford to stay there and they really want to move somewhere else but they're too nervous to because they just don't think there's going to be enough work for them and so I think there is with, with some people I think especially of my generation there is an appetite to leave London and to work in TV and other places but there's a nervousness because they just don't think there's enough work and I think you're right the, the thing with independent production companies there needs to be more outside London it's, it's insane how many there are in London like I couldn't believe how many there were and there's a lot of work. Um, you just you do need to to make you know to spread that out more. And if you had clusters that people knew they could confidently move to a city and have enough work year round, you'd slowly start to change things. I think. Mm -hmm. But the city that's benefiting most from that is where mm. I now live, which is Bristol. Yeah. And people will openly say, mm. and they'll say this because I no longer have a regional mm. accent, that it's like London. And I didn't want to move to the north. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So, and it's getting to the point where Bristol may as well be on the daily line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's 90 minutes between Bristol and London mm. now, and it is a place where you can claim regionality and still live basically in the London bubble. Yeah. And that's not good enough. Now, I love Bristol, and I'm really pleased to see Bristol's uh, um, independent production companies, you know, um, doing well in the, the city. But it, it's it's in some ways doing well because it's an adjunct of London. And what we need is a breaking of London's dominance. Mm. Um, but we're asking people to do that. You have to go to people's offices in London and ask people from London to stop being the, their dominance, which is why I, th I think Dorothy's right. We should, you know, the, if this government had any belief in its central uh, policy of levelling up, um, it wouldn't be talking about China, um, um, privatising Channel 4. It would be making Channel 4 sell that HQ and move uh, to Manchester. I'm going to go with your home audience uh, or Leeds less successfully. <laughs> it's about investing in people from those regions as well, isn't it? So it's about giving young people the opportunity to be able to train and move up yeah. on TV and not have to leave. Yeah. You know, like they can stay in the city they're from and start working and, and carve out a career and, you know, have an identity there and not feel that they have to go to London because that's part of the problem. People go and they don't come back. You want people to be able to sustain a career, you know, closer to where they're from. Which is the case in other countries. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in Germany, there's television production in Berlin, in Cologne, in Frankfurt and other places. There isn't, you know, you don't have to go to Berlin. Mm. Well, that's partly because, you know, in London's not just the biggest city in Britain, it's the biggest city in Europe. Yeah. There's no country that has this level of metropolitan um, uh, dominance uh, that, that, that Britain does. Um, so in some ways, this is part of a bigger, a bigger problem that the South East is just Far too dominant. You know, the, the the London. You know, Disraeli said London was a, you know, a city, not a, not a nation, not a city. Um, but this is a, this is, again, TV is too important uh, to be dominated by one city because you can't say this is ours. We can't have national broadcasters. We can't talk about shared stories, and we can't know ourselves, and we can't mm. report on ourselves if it's all done from one one city. Yeah. And your point, I think, although I was joking about the Leeds thing. Actually, imagine if you were somebody working for Channel 4 who did move to Leeds and now Channel 4 is going to be privatised and you must be thinking, well, I, I gave up my life in London in good faith to make a great new life for myself and now what's, what's going to happen to me? And, and I think that is what a lot of people think about their career. Is there a long-term career here, or will I have to uproot myself and my family again? It, it would make so much sense for those young people in TV to live in the north of England because they could have much better lives. There's an interesting model of devolved industries, which is universities actually, because I, I have to confess that I'm from London, and worse than that, I'm from Islington, but I am a historian of the north of England um, and have therefore spent most of my working life up here. But um, academics move around to universities, but you have to set the university up first. So there's a sense that you have to build something before they will come. Um, before I open it up to people's questions, though, I'll ask the panel if they've got anything else to say. I was telling um, my guest here today um, an anecdote at lunch, but it's completely true. Once I had the leader of a major cha British charity up to Manchester and was showing them around, and we were going to the Harris in Preston, 
and they asked me why it was taking so long to get to Preston because wasn't that part of Manchester? <laughs> and it's quite astonishing how people in the southeast, and I can say this as a Londoner, have no idea. My f members of my family sort of worry for me slightly, having moved so far away to the north. Will, will I cope? One of my old university tutors at Oxford once told somebody else when I got a job up here, I'm so pleased to get a job in Manchester. What can we do to help Hannah and rescue her from the north? So there's this ingrained sense that it's really another country once you get outside that donut. Yeah. My yeah. first lovely paper in Waltham Forest, um, I was asked where I had lived previously, and I said Manchester. And the sub-editor said, so you'll have lived out in the countryside there. <laughs> and I said, you know, Manchester is a really big city. And uh, I don't know, have you heard of the Industrial Revolution? And he said, oh, yes, I've heard of that. And I said, Manchester. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, those factories and everything, they're not the countryside. And I, I mean, he was particularly ignorant, but um, uh, it was extraordinary. Yeah, there's a kind of north and it's coloured dark on the map, and bad things happen there. And I think that's a sense of... I noticed when the BBC came up and people were coming to Chalton, where I live, and they were all in their 30s. Nobody older was kind of relocating. Young people who wanted to have kids thought, I'll give it a punt, because I'm so desperate to not live in a flat anymore in London. But that was it for the relocation. It seems being so terrifying. But I made a programme years ago with Charles Wheeler, you know, journalism. very highly thought of international journalists of the highest calibre. And we sent him to Burnley and he came back and he said, it was extraordinary. <laughs> there were um, <laughs> all these um, Indians and Pakistanis there. I had no idea. <laughs> I mean, and I... I, I it, Charles's wife's Indian. I know that was even more surprising, yeah. but he hadn't met her in Burnley. No, no. Maybe, I don't know where he'd met her, but he he he... He didn't know. How could it be he didn't know? And I guess in part that's representations of the North in the press and on television as well as a kind of alien place. Yeah, if he'd got his ideas from Coronation Street, it was yeah, very white. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. I remember being more junior and having to drive around senior directors. You know, I'd, I'd be the person to take them up north because obviously I was from here, so I'd know where everywhere was. And they wouldn't, un they couldn't understand how far away places were. They just all thought that it was within like half an hour. They didn't understand where Hull was or they had absolutely no idea. It was... Or that really Newcastle was actually quite a long way away. Yeah, they away thought Newcastle was right by Manchester. Yeah. They didn't realise that it would take several hours. Yeah, you're laughing, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I used to work with a producer who had a, a single accent that represented the North, the jokey comedy accent, and it was supposed to sort of cover the geographical area from the sort of the M25 up to the Scottish border. And I'm not sure geographically where it was closest to, whether it was Lancashire or Yorkshire, but it was his sort of Northern accent that was dropped out the, the drop of a hat. It was, it was deployed. And it was absolutely the appalling arrogance of, of this is one uh, homogenistic place that doesn't really really matters. Senior people in television have those, those attitudes, but they're very old. This, I mean, we're fighting against a, a very old historical trope. I mean, went down Bo Brummel, who was the sort of, you know, the, the figure in the early 19th century connected to the royal family. When his regiment was moved to Manchester, he wrote in his diary, I wasn't counting on having to serve abroad. <laughs> he was in Brighton moving to Manchester. <laughs> Actually, I could tell you, travel accounts haven't changed much. Since, since the 18th century. I used to give a, a talk on 18th century travel accounts of the, of the North. I work on the 18th century. But I started that talk off with a restaurant review of a Manchester restaurant, which was all about how everything was so shiny and the women were so brown and everything was so weird because it was Manchester and it was like they were on safari rather than just traveling to the North. I would love to open up to questions. So if anybody has a question, please put your hand up. I think we've got a roving mic, have we? Yeah. Yes. So, so lady at the back and then gentleman over here. Yeah. Actually, I've learned to say person because I once misgendered somebody recently because my eyesight is quite bad. So person <laughs> at the back, yes. Hi. Do you want to stand? I don't know who to stand up. Um, 
So I'm asking this in a slightly sort of tongue in cheek way, but I work in the media and um, probably tell by my accent, I'm a Mancunian, very proudly so. Um, and I sort of predominantly work in London these days. Um, and when I come back, I sort of get the train and I, I feel this enormous sense of relief when I get off the train in Manchester. And it's just that feeling of pride, slight relaxation. It's kind of, I feel much more at ease. Um, I sort of half slightly wonder in the back of my head if you know if if Manchester did become a bit you know the the, the power you know recognizes the kind of powerhouse that it is that it would kind of lose some of its charm in a way like if if lots of people did relocate to the north and it was seen as being this this hub and it sort of regained its rightful place you know um that that some of that kind of magic in the water would disappear a little bit um, and like this, a kind of secret would be out. That so makes should sense. Manchester remain a secret, <laughs> Lisa? Um, <laughs> no, I think we need like as much, as many jobs and as much TV to be made here as possible, to be honest. Yeah, just more, 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 more TV should be made here, you know, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. I, I think I, I live in a city that's having um, the renaissance that I would love to see for Manchester in terms of television production. Bristol's got a real swagger to it. Uh, it was always the centre of natural history programming. Um, there's huge amounts of um, money coming in. P London production companies are moving entirely to Bristol because of new rules about um, uh, production spend outside of London, not as much as they should be, but those rules, those changes are happening. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sort of living through this renaissance in Bristol and it's it's fantastic and I would long for that for Manchester. But as we were saying, all that would be, if it went, if it was more successful than it could possibly dream, it would be returned to what was there before Granada was dismantled. So person here at the end, second row with glasses on. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to say man. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident. You check. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I grew up in Bolton and a working class lad and the proudest day of my life was when I got my job at Granada Television that had been broadcasting all these interesting programmes into my living room. But when I went to work at Granada and eventually became an editor, I worked on everything, documentaries, drama, sport, quizzes, news, everything apart from wildlife documentaries is the only thing I've ever worked on in my life. But now television is a very pigeonholed, it says, have you got experience of this? Have you got experience of X? But I thought the melting pot of working on everything and being mentored by a wide range of people was so important to my career. And that just doesn't sort of happen anymore. And we used to eject the tapes and they go to transmission and that was it. And now you make a program and it goes off and someone sends you a page of notes telling you how you've made it wrong and how your music is wrong and how you're not appealing to the right kind of audience and they've done tests with demographics and it doesn't fit. And in a world of sort of TikTok and YouTube where things go instantly, that doesn't resonate anymore, but then London commissioners just, they, they, they love telling you how you've made it all wrong and it's all wrong. It de-skills the industry. And I don't know how in a world where children don't watch television anymore, they, they only watch on demand and TikTok and YouTube and whatever new app comes along, how you build this new panacea of a creative Manchester using talent where people can flourish and, and be mentored and discover where their voices and how they make programs and, and learn from one genre and take it to another genre, which is so important for the creative industries. If you could build something like that, I'm in, but I don't see how you, how you can do this in a world that's, ch that's changing all the time. But I think that's so important that the breadth of what was being made and what you could move through, uh, that was what made Granada for me, was that there was opportunities to move between genres and find where you fit and learn from very talented and creative people. Lots to unpick there. Who wants to start? I think, yeah. if I may, I think that, that what you're describing is what television culturally was like outside of London. It took something of the scale of London for that culture of specialism and pigeonhole to develop. When I was first at the BBC in Bristol, it was exactly like that. People were making uh, observational documentaries, then they were making you know, what we'd, we'd call you know, um, reality shows, or they'd be making arts programs or history programs, and people moved around, whether it was editors or producers. And this world of specialism came hand in hand with the increasing metropolitanization um, of television. Smaller um, centers of production where there aren't the huge hordes of people working in television encourage that fluidity between genres. So the, the phenomenon you're describing, I think, is actually a feature of the overdominance of London. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, um, 
Paul Greengrass started on World in Action. Well, he started in regional programs and um, sport. He started in sport. Um, and, um, you know, now he's a major feature film director. So I, I think you make a very good point. That's a bit spooky. That's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, person on the end here with sandals on. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the discussion. It's very interesting. Um, I think uh, in 1962, the first film of the Beatles was done by Leslie Woodhead um, for Granada TV. And of course, at the time, uh, a lot of this discussion we're having now about TV was also about music. Obviously, you had, um, you, know, you know, ukulele players in the north and stuff like that. But serious music was was in was in the south. And then, what's interesting, of course, is if you ran this whole discussion, and I'm trying to make the link to the British Pop Archive Thank you. Uh, Thank you, via via music. Uh, you know, and then you think of Sheffield, Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, I think, was the Animals and Brian Ferry and probably Sting, unfortunately, but others. Uh, um, you'd come up with a very, very different picture. Um, and so I, I was just wanting your thoughts on if we were to think about music as a model, what might that make for TV and what can music what can we learn from the way that music has worked? And obviously there's still a London bias in all kinds of ways uh, that might work for TV. Oh, crikey. Any takers? I mean, I yeah. One of the geniuses, of the genius behind Granada was that it actually rode the wave of music in the 60s. So many of those you know, great interventions, I mean, whisking Mick Jagger out of, outside of prison to do that remarkable um, piece of archive that costs thousands of pounds a minute now to show it was just, you know, just brilliant. It took a swagger, it took confidence to do that. The way that um, the, the regional nature of pop music, which itself was a product of social mobility, it was a product of a new wave of, of polytechnics and universities. I, I went to see Paul McCartney speak um, recently and you know, he pointed out something which is really, really obvious, which is that they all went to grammar schools, you know, apart from Ringo. Um, they were really, really educated. Um, they were really cultural. They listened to lots of music and they were, they were able to know each other because there was a proper bus system in Liverpool in the 50s and 60s. They were product, as was Granada, of a, a reg, a, an age of social mobility and regional uh, of, uh, regions on the rise. The, we're at this moment, we keep talking about levelling up, we, de we never talk about how we got to the point mm. where this catchphrase means something, why they, for I think entirely cynical reasons, were able to tap into something. We sleepwalked into accentuating the historical dominance of a city that's more dominant than the capital of any country, any developed country that there is. Um, and, you know, the story of music, whether it's the 60s or, the, or Britpop in the 90s, is of the North. One of the reasons why Bernstein came here was they, there was two things about the North about the North that they thought were attractive. One is its long history of cultural output. The other is everyone's at home because it's always raining. That was literally their two calculations. I think that's genius, but that, you know, Depressingly, both are true. Um, um, I think music, in some ways, is part of the same story. When I was growing up, the thing that made me excited about regional television growing up in Newcastle was the tube. That, you know, all of these, on a Friday evening, all of these bands that we'd heard of were knocking around Newcastle. We used to sneak around the pubs because the people who'd been on the tube would be getting drunk. Uh, in the bars of Newcastle. It was just astonishing. You could be in the bar and the people who'd been on the tube were there. I didn't think that was anything unusual, that famous people were in a, a regional city that was producing great television programmes. It was. It was a, turned out to be uh, a blip. Thank you. Yes, over there. Hi, <clears throat> my name's Andy Spinoza. I've been in, I'm a, a Londoner, but I've been here since 1979 in uh, journalism and the media. Um, I'm researching a book about Manchester, and on the Granada page on Wikipedia, there's an intriguing uh, little factoid, which I wonder if anyone on the panel would 
knows anything about and care to confirm. I mean, Lord Bernstein, who, who obviously owned Granada, was uh, a Londoner as well. And it seemed he was infected with, infected with Mancunian self-confidence because when Granada lost the Yorkshire part of its license in the, uh, I think, the mid-60s, he, he said he was outraged and he said he would raise the matter with the United Nations. Um, and I wondered if any of you had any knowledge whether that was actually carried through and, and by what means. Uh, or maybe if there's something in the archive that might, um, that might uh, prove that point, I don't know. I'm going to ask Steve whether he knows. No, I don't know. It's a sort of Tony Wilson style thing to say, you know, in a grandstanding <laughs> manner. I suppose the serious question uh, arising for all that is what would Granada have looked like if it was both, if it carried on both the Yorkshire and the North West and Granada land? That's a sort of interesting kind of counterfactual, isn't it? I don't know uh, if the panel have any ideas about that. BBC and Channel 4 because they'd have to not spend all their time making promises about moving people out of London because it wouldn't be necessary. But I think most of all it would mean that generations of people from the North wouldn't have had to think I can uh, go to London or not uh, make it to television. And my, my route to television was dependent on one thing. My older sister happened to be living in London at the period when I was doing work experience and the only way I could possibly afford to get the experience I needed to get on in television was by being in London. The only way I could be in London was by, sit, by sleeping on my sister's sofa for six months. Um, or else it wouldn't have been possible because it didn't exist and TV was dead in the northeast and still is dead in the northeast. That's just a fundamental unfairness. You know, the biggest advantage you have if you want to get into television are wealth and being in London. Uh, and then we wonder why all the kids are from wealthy families in London. Um, I was going to answer your question, Andy, but I'm going to answer it with this question first that um, I've been handed in a piece of paper. Fortunately, as a historian, I'm an excellent paleographer because this handwriting is slightly challenging. Um, <laughs> could you tell us a bit more about the Granada TV archive? What kinds of resources are available to researchers and students? How might it embolden Manchester as a distinctive TV cluster today? And that question is from Robert online. Yeah, from myself. <laughs> yeah, it does sound. <laughs> as a plant. <laughs> Yes, Robert. <laughs> let, let me tell you about the Granada TV archive and perhaps answer Andy's question at the same time. Um, we haven't got the whole archive in yet and all that we've had is a Excel spreadsheet with box um, headings, titles. We're expecting between 750 and 1,000 boxes, archive boxes, so it's fairly big, but they're not sure, and there may be more than that. Several of those boxes, Andy, are Bernstein papers, um, and several of them are uh, specifically business papers from the 50s and early 60s. So I reckon you will be able to have a look, and Robert, Poor old Robert is a real person, can I say, and answering his real questions. Yes, these resources will be available to students and researchers and members of the public to look at in due course. I just want to temper your excitement before you rush off to the John Rylands Library, because most of it's not even in the building yet. And once it gets into the building, it will need to be looked at, conservation will need to have a look, and we'll need to see what sort of state it is. There's a whole row there of people from the library who are here in case I make, I thought they were here to lend me their support. But now I realize they're here in case I make any rash promises. <laughs> Um, but the whole, cataloging. yeah, cataloguing, yes, no, absolutely. I mean, box, it's great that we've got box titles. We assume that they're correct, but they might not be. Um, and of course, there are some commercial sensitivities for any business archive. So, so I hope that answers a lot of Robert's questions. That the key point of the British Pop Archive is to get these things back into 
public hands, not public ownership, because this is a long-term loan, this archive, but that, that, that this is accessible to members of the public and you do not have to be a member of the University of Manchester to go and use uh, the Rylands Library. That's very important. Now, Robert asks a very interesting question. How might the Granada Archive itself embolden Manchester as a, dis a distinctive TV cluster today? I, I don't know, really, if I'm honest, but, but perhaps. I mean, the university starting a new innovation district on the old UMIST area. I would hope that's exactly the sort of place we could get Manchester-based creative industries um, based. And, and, and my sense, before I go to that very patient person there on the end, thank you, is that you have to, having a kind of history of something, whatever it is, in a place, makes it a more obvious choice for more of it in the future. Yeah. yeah. Just be confident yeah. about your future. You need to be proud of your past. Very good. Thank you. I will nick that and use it as a strap line. But 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 I think I think it's true. I, I have to say, I feel there's no lack of confidence in Mancunians about their city, which is great, but it would be great if we saw ourselves again as a sort of great programme-making city, you know, and, and that change. Gentlemen on the end of the, of the row there. So my question is kind of following on from what you're talking about with the pop archive. I was really interested in the materials that lists on the postcard, what's going, what it's going to constitute. So my question about the archive, because you've all made amazing programs, if you had um, many resources, a big budget, and a lack of Southern prejudice, what would you use the archive for in an ideal world to make? What would you make utilising the archive? And what would you hope it would inspire people to make especially when it's talk about counterculture, and you mentioned our democracy is in trouble. So what would you make, and what would you like to see it inspire people to do? I feel like I'm in a really stressful meeting with a commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> and he also sounds a bit like another plant, actually, from me. But money, no object. What would you do if you had this base in Manchester or any other regional centre? The base or the, or the use of the archive? Uh, the... the archive would be great, but it doesn't have to be. Can I broaden it out? Yeah. I think you just w want to set up d development, teams of, d teams of development, um, journalists and programme yeah. makers to come up with ideas. That, that's where everything stems from, isn't it? And you want that to then branch out and, you know, it's the ideas that are, that yeah. are key. You need to invest money in coming yeah. up with the ideas. Yeah. If you've got good ideas for programmes, then that's, that's half, the, half the battle. Yeah, sorry to pick on you, Liz, but it did sound like a tough interview question there. <laughs> David? I, I think television as, as an industry needs to create a new generation who aren't from the same region, from the same um, socioeconomic backgrounds urgently, desperately, or it can't do its fundamental job of representing um, uh, the nation. Um, and I think the only way of doing that is to create, create centres outside of London and make it available for people to build their careers. We wouldn't see that. It would take 20 years. It would take a generation for that to happen. But that all that would do would be get us back to where we were. My, my business partner began his career in Manchester. My, my, one of my best friends in journalism school, when we left, he came to work in Manchester with somebody um, who'd built his career in Manchester. And they, you know, they were our mentors that, you know, the, the, because they'd been able to rise up in the industry here. And then we cut the throat of regional production. And we're wondering why the industry is full of people from the same private schools and the same, you know, those two cities, London and just outside of London. Um, it needs massive um, uh, intervention. Uh, decades long commitment and I think in the way television is structured now that means commitment to where the money is spent where the decisions are made um, I've in my career and I've been in television since 1997 um, it was in just before the pandemic it was the first time I ever pitched for a program pitched for work not in an office in London I went to an office in Bristol where I lived and pitched an idea for the first time in my entire career and I must have done it in London hundreds of times it's ridiculous
and we, we normalize what's abnormal. That is one city. It's a very big city, but it's just one city. It's completely abhorrent. Um, and yet we accept it, and we shouldn't. And plus that completely shapes the nature of the programs that are made, because ultimately you want people from different places to be telling their stories and to be make, being able to make their ideas, don't you? And that it, it would change what was on yeah. our TVs very directly. Yeah. We don't know what, how people would make programs about other parts of the world if they were based in Manchester. We get London's views of the outside of the world. We don't really know what history programs would be made. We get what people in London think history should be, should be like. It's not just that it's based in London, it is the London's gaze, the metropolitan gaze through which we view um, our television output. That's what's wrong and that's what was special about Granada. Granada was Manchester. Mm -hmm. World in Action was Manchester. It was different to Panorama, but not just because it was ITV, not just because it was independent, because it was Manchester. You know, the term levelling up really means that the poor north where there are a bunch of saddos one day, could it be possible that they will be as good <laughs> as people in Islington? Because it's levelling up to what? It's levelling up there to them. There's an insult in that. It, it's incredibly insulting. And, you know, one of the things I really object about still in news is that um, coverage of things which happen uh, above Birmingham, it's all about really depressing things that happen. And there's so uh, far too little that's celebratory. What was great when I worked on Granada Reports was that if you were a researcher, um, uh, you had to take it in turns to listen to music and decide what music would be played on a Friday night at the end of the program. And you were told, if you get it wrong, you could be like the person who missed the Beatles. And then um, the, the whole idea was that news and celebration of the culture of Manchester were not two different things. Celebrating the culture of bands in the north of England was news. Thank you. That gentleman in the end, the sort of last question, please. Sydney Bernstein. Um, had a vision and a dream, of course we all know that, and in a nod to the late, great Ray Fitzwalter, who was a producer of World in Action, and his book, The Dream That Died, about these topics we're discussing today, does any of the panel believe that the dream did die, and if so, when? Well, I never agreed with the title of that book, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, you know, wasn't it a, a, a dream betrayed? You know, um, I, because that wasn't just about the North, it was about also the idea that um, great current affairs television doesn't happen anymore, and it does, and, and we can all be... Um, too depressed about things. There are fantastic programs being made now and they're being made in all different ways and they're being made by people who would never have been allowed to make them in the past. And in so many ways, things are better compared to, you know, when I started and I was the only woman on that program now in British news, I think nearly every major news outfit in this country is run by women. Um, abs uh, you know, there were, everybody at Channel at um, Granada was white and there were only five black people worked there and they suffered racism. So in lots of ways, things are much better. We just need a much bigger chunk of it to come up here. But um, yeah, television industry in this country is so vibrant. That's the point. That's why we are all so concerned about it being destroyed by this government, because it's fantastically successful creatively, and it, it's a huge uh, contributor to the economy of this country. So uh, Ray was admirable in many ways, but he could get um, a bit down about things. 
That's a fantastic way to end things on an upbeat note. Thank you, Dorothy. Always fighting, never giving up. Very important, I think, for all of us. <laughs> Can I encourage you to come along to the John Rylands Library? The launch exhibition collection opens to the public on Thursday. I would suggest don't come this weekend, but come a bit later on, because um, it's quite hot in there, isn't it, ladies? Yes. Um, but there's lots to be seen. This is only the beginning. Uh, the focus on the 80s and 90s is, is deliberate, but we will be doing lots more in the future. So do stay in touch and come and see things. And thank you so much for coming today. And thank you so much for our very generous guests. Thank you.